A lot of landlords see themselves as good people. They are participating in an immensely harmful um, economic system. We've got to make it embarrassing to be a landlord again. We've got to rediscover a sense of shame and a sense of direct participation in the harm that we see around us today. They seem to think that they're entitled to respect and I just feel that like the law is on their side, economics is on their side, the politicians are on their side, the courts are on their side. The idea that we shouldn't mock them and humiliate them and make them feel ashamed is, is, is laughable. Britain's wealth is rooted in landlordism and that's a dangerous place to be in. Nick Bano, hi. Welcome to Politics Show. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, well, thank you for coming. How would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, I am a, a housing lawyer specialising in legal aid housing work. I've also got a bit of a background in more street politics kind of things and have an interest in uh, a Marxist understanding of, of politi political economy. And is that the impetus behind this book? Yeah, I just felt like a lot of the um, writing we were seeing about housing used some Marxist concepts a bit loosely and I wanted to get really under the kind of under the hood of, of the housing crisis and see how it works from a kind of particularly Marxist perspective. I think... I mean, I'm going to ask you a really, really broad question. Mm. In broad terms, what do you mean by that? By a Marxist perspective? Yeah. Well, um, classical economists, neoclassical economists, see the role of economics as the allocation of scarce resources. And Marx opens capital by saying, we live in a world that has so much stuff in it. There is so many commodities in the world. How is it that everyone is poor? So he starts from a place of abundance and he tries to work out what the forces are in the world that make us live lives of misery and struggle in a world that produces so much. And this takes a vaguely similar approach to housing. And it says not only is there so much housing in Britain, but there's an awful lot of housing wealth. And how is it that when there's all this money and all these homes, we live in cities that are packed with gunnels with, with homes. How is it that all of us are living in housing poverty? and in very, very bad conditions. Is that why you've just written for The Guardian about how we don't need more supply? Yeah, it really touched a nerve. The, the supply issue is really kind of a throwaway line in the book. I just had this um, quick justification of why I'm not talking about supply. But I feel that supply has dominated the, the discourse for so long that people found it really surprising. A lot of people found it quite upsetting and shocking that you challenge the accepted wisdom, that you kind of put the... Put the um, the, the property developers to prove that there is this massive shortage because that's not really what the stats bear out if we look at Britain in historical terms or if we look at the UK um, in comparative international terms. Mm. But I mean, you know, the short, I suppose that ex accepted wisdom mm. is because you would think that with more supply that would, I suppose, liquidate the market and make the housing stock more affordable. Yeah. Is that not, is that not true? Well, that's the thinking. I think it's difficult to find a great deal of evidence for that. If it does work like that, then the amount of surplus you'd need to build to have any meaningful impact on um, price would be staggering. Um, and given that the planet is dying and given that there are other ways of doing it, given that we can regulate a housing market out of crisis, then it seems to me um, dangerous to obsess ourselves with the idea of supply to, um, to build a vast surplus when we don't need to, when we can just tweak a few legal and economic levers and get ourselves out of it that way. Talk to me about regulating the prices down. Yeah, so in most countries and most sensible places around the world, um, landlords don't have a complete free reign to work out what they can extract from tenants without physically killing them. In most places around the world, there's, there's some sort of cap or break or regulation that governs the way in which rental markets work. And, and of course, historically, that was the case here too, but it was completely destroyed um, in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. So <laughs> we're quite unusual in not having any form of rent regulation. And one of the things that lots of us are campaigning for is to, to restore it with the hope that that would restore ourselves to something like a pre-crisis state of affairs. Because this landmark, landmark policy is going to be introduced in Scotland. Yes. But the, the accepted wisdom of that down here is that that actually drives up prices. I don't know if that's the accepted wisdom. I think it's On said a right. lot. I think it's said yeah. an awful lot. Um, <laughs> And I think it's true that rent controls can be done badly, but that's not a conceptual problem with rent controls. If, if it were the case that rent controls were generally bad, then they would have been abolished in every country in Europe, when of course they tend to be present in most European countries. Where there are problems with implementing rent controls, they can, they can be fixed, we can make things better. But the idea that um, a particular policy is leading to problems and therefore we just need to let the free market run rampant in Scottish housing is, is bizarre to me. Mm. But I mean, so in, in layman's terms, mm. and feel free to talk to me like an idiot, if you are, if you're going to set a period of time in which 
rents cannot rise. Yeah. Is that not going to give way to, to landlords just pushing up the prices to start with? It might, but then of course that's a short-term pain for a much longer-term um, public benefit. And I also think that all of these scare stories we hear about rent controls generally paint a, a picture of a world that's a lot better than the one we're currently living in. Like a lot of these, these, these healthscapes I would take over the present housing crisis that so many people are suffering through. Right. What about, I mean, is there not a possibility as well that, I mean, over the last couple of years, obviously, you know, well, after COVID, we've seen um, a sharp rise, a, mm. a ridiculous rise in rents, particularly in, you know, in London, in Manchester, and, and even actually suburban towns. But is there not a chance that rents are going to come down by themselves? Uh, well, the class of landlords is not known for being generous and unself-interested. <laughs> yeah. They're, of course, assisted by lettings agents whose only job it is to tell them, look, this is what we think the market will tolerate. This is what you can get out of this property. So it would be surprising um, if landlords uh, acted against their own self-interest by saying, I'm going to undercut and go below the market mm. rent. So there's a chain then that's driving rents at the moment. There are structural forces at work. Um, I think... When a, when a landlord buys a rental property, baked into that sale price is the idea that the rent will keep on rising. That's what makes it valuable to them. Mm -hmm. So when a landlord says, I'm not going to put the rent up in line with the market, I'm going to keep it low, that signals or contributes to the idea that it wasn't worth the purchase price in the first place. It signals or contributes to the idea that the next landlord who wants to buy it is not making a very good investment because in fact the rent it's currently generating is, is lower. So there's a, there's a structural impetus on landlords to raise the rent. It justifies the purchase price of their product. It's not just mean people saying we want to drive people further into poverty. So going back to what you were talking about before then, mm. when you were talking about how um, supply is not driving house prices. So, I mean, is it landlords? What is the root cause? What is driving? The, the, the Marxist argument is that rents in cities are what he calls monopoly prices. So it's the highest price that will be tolerated under given social circumstances without physically, um, you know, driving the class of tenants out of existence. Mm -hmm. And what landlords have been doing over the past few decades is realizing and developing their economic power. And what's, what seems to be happening at the moment is landlords are realizing that they can just say, do you know what, there is a fee for viewing. And they say it and it becomes true. It's not that there's suddenly a massive structural adjustment in the number of people or the number of homes. It's landlords demonstrating the economic power they have over us. They make a demand, they see if we meet it. And when we do, they say, that is the reality now. But is that happening all over then? Uh, it's certainly happening in London. Um, They're charging for viewing or was, am I, am I sorry, did I just misinterpret that? I've 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 heard rumours about charging for viewings. I've heard rumours about bidding wars. I've heard rumours yeah. about listed rents not being the actual rent you pay. Um, and of course, the more landlords cotton onto this, the worse the problem becomes. Right. So we're creating a we're creating our own demise actually by giving well, into them. <laughs> we don't really have a choice. Um, it's it, we're not being generous here. I mean, we, we we really do need places to live. And if this is the, the demand that landlords make of us, we don't really have a choice but to say, well, that's what I'll have to do. Can you talk to me about state uh, state backed rent rising that you talk yeah. about? Yeah. So w when you have these short life tenancies which dominate the private rented sector, where you have absolutely no security, um, landlords are free to demand whatever rent they want. And when the state says this is the housing benefit, and by the way, I'm putting housing benefits up what the landlords can do is just generate that state spending into additional income for themselves. They can raise the rents in line with um, housing benefit rises when there is no cap, when there is no break. Mm -hmm. So you have this system where even the best intentioned policies of the state, which are aimed to kind of reduce poverty and to make people's lives easier, are just converted into higher state spending on landlords, which of course is a massive problem for the tax bill um, and a massive benefit for landlords. So the taxpayer is subsidising landlords. To the tune of billions of pounds, and it's a number that keeps going up. Makes me feel really good, that. Yeah, well, uh, you must be a landlord. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, just I'm paying uh, yeah, twice. I'm, I'm joking. Yeah, well, exactly, yeah, exactly. Um, it's, 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 it's the state that's paying. It's obviously tenants that are paying, and it's employers that are paying, because obviously wages in this country have to be sensationally high just so that people can meet their housing costs. But also with housing benefit, a landlord doesn't have to take a tenant that is on housing benefit, they can say that certain properties are, are exempt for some reason. Well, in principle, they do because it tends to be unlawfully discriminatory 
to refuse to take housing benefit tenants. But that tends to take brave and dogged tenants bringing legal challenges. It's not very good at filtering through into the reality of the world. And we know that it happens. Yeah. We know that it happens a lot. But what you do have is um, the sort of base layer of housing provision in, in Britain is, 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 is met by housing benefit. Um, that, that's the state kind of underwriting the bottom of the housing market and everything else is built on top of that. So as and when housing benefit rises and, and the lowest rents meet to ma- rise to match those, the higher up rents rise with it and it's a tide that seems to be lifting all ships. So housing benefit is driving higher in, rents? In part. And obviously I'm not saying the state is bad and the state should cut housing benefit. Of course it shouldn't. But I do think it's interesting to think about the way in which the state is tearing its hair out saying, what are we going to do about the housing crisis? Well, at the same time, just having this open checkbook and saying, for us, <laughs> landlords can demand what they want and we will just continue to pay. But what's the simple resolution to that then? Because, I mean, when you talk about supply or, you know, supply not being the answer, if there was a supply of homes that were owned by the council, is that not a resolution to the housing benefit crisis? A- absolutely. And of course, housing benefit, housing housing council tenants are rent capped, housing tenants are rent controlled. Same with social housing providers. Um, If we did that in the private rented sector, of course, state spending on housing would massively go down. uh, You know, I'm particularly concerned about um, the housing that's provided to homeless households, which are often charged nightly, um, which are charged at utterly Mm. exorbitant rates. And many, many of them are in buildings that the council had once built as council housing. So the state's paid for it once and now it's continuing to pay for it over and over again in the form of private rents. So this goes back to Margaret Thatcher? A lot of it does. It goes back to Margaret Thatcher and to Tony Blair, because of course, while it's right to point out that Thatcher um, dismantled rent controls, what kept the landlords in check for most of the 20th century was that they were scared that whenever the Tories were generous to landlords, Labour would come and turn it round again. And when you have a long-term investment like land, that tended to, um, to keep the landlords at bay a bit. So when Tony Blair said, rent controls are never coming back, I'm keeping what Thatcher had, right. that signals to the landlords, you go wild, you go crazy. So what sort of signal is uh, Keir Starmer uh, sending to landlords at the moment then? If you know, if we take the premise that perhaps he's, um, he, well, he's utilising a bit of Blair. Well, I think he's being curiously quiet. And I think what's interesting is that he, I mean, he's been outflanked on the renters' rights bill. I don't think it's a policy he himself would have, um, would have come up with. And he, he can't do very much better than the bill that the Tories originally put forward. So he's, he's, he's not saying very much about housing, um, but what he is is, is, is n- nothing extraordinary, nothing, nothing remarkable compared to what, what any other politician is saying. Mm. The renters' reform bill, I mean, it, it has dominated mm. um, the news cycle, partly because it's the only policy that is actually being put forward by the Conservatives yeah. at the moment. Um, and a lot of those, um, the original ideas have been watered down and they have been relaxed. But there is one little bit in there about Section 21 yes. that I find really interesting. Yeah. I was just wondering, like, what's your interpretation of abolishing Section 21? When I saw the bill, I thought it was surprisingly good. I think when the Tories were kind of forced into making this pledge in the 2019 election manifesto, I think they thought it was quite a technical, fluffy, family-friendly policy. I don't think they quite realised that Section 21 is one of the key um, uh, kind of cornerstones of the Thatcherite housing settlement. As I explained a minute ago, it's what allows landlords to demand a higher rent whenever housing benefit goes up. So when you abolish Section 21 and introduce that little bit more security, it becomes that much easier for tenants to say, actually, I'm not paying this higher rent. You're going to have to go through a legal process to raise it. So it should, it could have the effect of dampening the kind of runaway pace of rent rises that we're used to seeing. I think if it is abolished, it'll take some time to bed in because, of course, it's been abolished in Scotland. And Scotland is is still, um, Scottish tenants are finding their power and Scottish landlords are realising the loss of theirs. But those kind of behavioural changes can take years, if not decades, to bed in. Well, also, I mean, you know, there's a there's a theoretical loss of power that could be experienced by the landlord. But, you know, we've just, we've just spoken about housing benefit a yep. moment ago. And we said that, you know, even though they are, landlords don't take tenants that, you know, have housing benefits, even though that they are legally required to. Mm. So, I mean, mm. will it actually... You know, will it give power back to tenants, do you think, in in actual practice? Because how many young people, especially in today's market, have the time or the know-how to take a landlord to court? Yeah, and of course, that's that's going to be the challenge that the housing movement faces. It's going to be reskilling 
um, a generation of renters as to their rights. But I do think it's going to be crucial in terms of the number of people who don't complain to their landlords about housing conditions because of Section 21. Um, it suddenly gives them a much a much safer environment to do that, to say, you know, I pay you money for this service. Yeah. You've got to fix the boiler, you've got to fix the damp. That's really interesting about not complaining because mm. it's it's true, isn't it? Most tenants don't don't speak up because they are worried that they're going to be evicted. I mean, I think I think it's true for all of us. I think we've all experienced it. And I think one of the really weird and amazing things about the housing market here is that if your landlord comes round and says, oof, there's a bit of a damp problem, I'm going to do something about that. You genuinely don't know whether that's the landlord behaving themselves or the landlord gearing up to evict you. So even if you have a nice landlord, you live under such a looming threat that, you know, it, play, it wreaks havoc with people's sense of stability mm. and, and their mental health and their capacity to build their lives. It's, it's, a, it's a horrible situation. Landlords don't really do too well with uh, being told that they have to, you know, with more regulations being uh, slapped on them. I mean, a couple of years ago, we were talking about, actually might have been last year, mm. we were talking about energy efficiency yes. and how all properties now had to be energy efficient you know you couldn't have a uh, single glazing or a roof yeah. that you know allowed heat to evaporate um how did that increased regulation go down well it it's yeah it wasn't popular and it's really interesting because i think a few years ago it would have been seen as something of a fringe issue but with the massive rise in energy bills the energy performance of people's homes is life-changing financial decisions and it's only fair that landlords should the ones, the ones who benefit from the housing crisis should be the ones who ensure that tenants aren't losing money, not, not only by paying their rent, but by paying extortionate energy bills for leaky flats and, and poor energy performance. But of course, if you add on these costs to landlords, yeah. costs that many would argue are actually just, you know, make, you know basic provisions that mm. make somewhere livable, uh, landlords apparently decide that they don't want to rent their homes out anymore. Yeah. Um, so yeah. what's the solution to that? Well, this is, I mean, I, I sort of take them at their word. And this is exactly what happened in, in, the, in the previous century, that where it became unprofitable to be a landlord, um, they sold up. And that was generally seen to be a good thing because it means more owner occupiers. Um, it means um, more uh, ability for local authorities to, to buy properties and repurpose them or redevelop them as council tenancies. And it just means people like more people living in better forms of tenure than the private rented sector, which is by far the worst. Do you think that councils would want to repurchase private property? We know that they did. Um, we know that they spent a lot of the 70s and 80s doing exactly that. Of course, things are a bit different now. But I mean, local politicians fall over themselves to promise more social housing. Mm. And if they were having to, if landlords were having to sell up at bargain basement prices, it's a good opportunity for local authorities. There's quite an interesting Lib Dem policy that um, came out a couple of months ago that's something that you don't hear very often but um mm. <laughs> that they uh, they wanted to sort of devolve planning permission so they wanted to give local areas more opportunity to, to well to decide what is in their local area yeah. do you think that councils would be able to purchase private property and make it into social housing if local people were able to decide what those properties were going to be used for. I mean, to be fair, in the last century, the way it worked was massive amounts of government grants and public and public money. Um, if if the government was interested in doing that, then then I think they would probably have to fund it, or at least change the way in which local authorities can access public loans. Um, but we know it can be done if there's a political will for it, because it happened 50 years ago. Do you think that there is a political will for it or will there be under Starmer? I know you said that he hasn't spoken much about housing, but do you, can you imagine it would be quite high up the agenda? I really hope that things will start to change. I really hope that we start to remember the old wisdom that we had throughout the 20th century in terms of what's called municipalisation, um, buying buying uh, property off distressed landlords. Um, I, I don't know if it will happen, but what I think is hopeful is that we're now starting to remember to have these conversations again about how grubby and harmful the business of landlordism is, about how we have it within our grasp to take property away from them and repurpose it if we really want to. And it, it encourages me that this is suddenly a hot topic. This is something we're beginning to talk about again. I know you're probably asked this all the time, but for the for the sake of the tape, mm. can, you, can you explain to me what you mean by the grubby business of landlords? I think... A lot of landlords see themselves as good people 
and I'm sure they probably are, but they are participating in an immensely harmful um, economic system. They are profiting from an immensely harmful uh, uh, system. And the way I think of it is um, it's a bit like um, people who use their phones while they're driving. Everyone seems to think they have some particular and unique excuse. But when you think about it statistically at a social level, we know that it's immensely dangerous. And um, anyone who is a landlord is is not just profiting, they're profiting sort of three times. They're getting the rental income, they're getting their mortgage paid off, and they're getting capital gains. So even those landlords who think, well, I could be charging more, they're doing extraordinarily well. And they're doing, uh, they're doing, they're doing extraordinarily well to everybody else's loss. It's really interesting, that phone analogy. <laughs> yeah. Do you think landlord, or landlording, is it rooted in individualism? It is here. And it, that's a weird thing about Britain is that, is that almost all of our landlords are just individual people. Um, I think, again, the old wisdom is worth discovering here because throughout the 20th century, the landlord was this figure of scorn, this, this really hated, reviled character. And there was a massive and deliberate social change under Thatcher and under Blair to reinvent the landlord um, instead of being this kind of um, often violent, always unpalatable character um, to be this sort of state-sanctioned, petty investor, an acceptable topic for the dinner, dinner table. Um, and I think if we want to be serious about reversing the housing crisis, we've got to make it embarrassing to be a landlord again. We've got to rediscover a sense of shame and a sense of direct participation in the harm that we see around us today. I've heard jokes before that landlords used to be uh, hung out of windows. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I don't like... Not physically, of, sorry, by yeah. their feet, just yeah, to be clear. <laughs> yeah, well, more often it was landlords doing the violence. I'm, I, I'm not a fan of, of, of kind of... Uh, chauvinist language around landlords I think um, you know it, it, it can lead to, to some to some nasty things I do think I do think they ought to be embarrassed I do think they ought to be ridiculed I thought I, I, it really fascinates me that whenever there is sort of a, a protest or a direct action about about a landlord they seem to think that they're entitled to respect and I just feel that like the law is on their side, economics is on their side, the politicians are on their side, the courts are on their side. The idea that we shouldn't mock them and humiliate them and make them feel ashamed is is, is laughable. Why do you think all of those, uh, well, all of those that you've just listed, why are they on the side of landlords? Well, we're in a dangerous situation where the argument of the book is that the housing market more broadly is rooted in profitable landlordism. What generates the vast house prices is the idea that if you're selling your house, you, you, you have to sell it to someone who may or may not be a landlord. So anyone buying it would have to at least compete with a landlord um, who's able to command these extravagant rents. So the, the, the rented sector is intimately tied in to the housing market more broadly. Mm -hmm. The government really, really, really can't have the housing market fail because it's um, destroyed a system of pensions, it's destroyed a system of social care, it's presided over a system of wage restraint, and house prices for an awful lot of people are the only kind of um, stability they have, the only kind of economic well-being they have. So a direct attack on landlordism is a much broader attack on the housing economy more, ba uh, more broadly. So it's, it's, it's dangerous territory to be in. And I think if you, if you don't want to be cynical about it and simply say, oh, well, the, 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 the MPs are all landlords and they're all in each other's pockets. If you want to be more generous than the interpretation is, they know that this, you know, Britain's wealth is rooted in landlordism and that's a dangerous place to be in. But that's that's really interesting because then as the, the number of renters grow every single year, you're, mm. you're, you've created a two-tier uh, society there. You've got an asset class who are able to, what well, you're talking about, mm. you know, social care, adult social care, they're going to be able to fund that. They're going to have a pension in yeah. that. Then you're going to have an entire cohort of people who, who physically can't do it. Is that not going to be more expensive for the state <laughs> yeah, in the long term? Yeah, not only can they not do it, but of course they're paying for the social care of their landlords and, and property owners. It's, it, it is something of a zero-sum game, and, and it's right that the, the bigger this phenomenon of landlordism becomes, the more people the state is going to have to look after. The irony being, of course, um, <laughs> they dismantled that system in the first place and replaced it with one of property rights, and it's, yeah, it's, it's coming back to bite them. That feels like the state has gotten larger then. Well, the housing benefit bill certainly got larger. Mm. Um, what the state is doing with its money seems to be a lot less. Um, right. it's, it seems like so much money is just diverted straight from taxes to 
uh, other people's mortgages and other people's pockets. When we look at councils and the number of councils that are going bankrupt at the moment, mm. how much of that do you think is linked to the increased pressures that they're facing with housing? Well, the councils themselves are being incredibly honest about that and saying we can't afford to house our homeless populations. Mm. We can't afford to meet the temporary accommodation costs we have. And we can't afford to replenish our social housing stocks. Um, housing and social care is, is obviously one of the biggest items of, of local authority spending. And it, it blows my mind that if we wanted to, we could just sort that out with rent controls. And we choose not to. We choose to let local authorities go bust instead. I just want to go back to a bit of the theory that you've got in the book. Yeah. So you talk about Karl Marx and Adam Smith and you link them and yeah. you say that both of them would not like the current housing system yeah. that we have. Can you tell me why? Well, uh, Marx and Smith both argued, and, and, and it's traditionally been true on the right, that, that landlordism is not a good thing. It's not a profitable economic activity. It's a pure drag um, on, on social production. It's, it's, it's taking away wealth that was created by other people. Um, that was a wisdom that held true for a very long time. Uh, and and I've, I think we've mentioned in the 1970s this kind of very relaxed attitude towards the collapse of the private rented sector. And it's, it's us who are living in this really weird um, political moment where the right supports landlords. Um, you would think that the right would be interested in lower state spending and you would think that they would be interested in lower wage bills and successful businesses. Um, instead, they seem to... They're very interested in, in property development, fine, but that seems to be intimately tied up with landlordism as well. So they find themselves coming out to bat for landlords in the name of property development. But that carries with it the idea that the state should carry on spending all this money on housing benefit, diverting all of this tax and these wages to the already wealthy. To make a crass argument mm. off the back of that, you could say, I didn't think that the right liked benefit scroungers. There you go. Exactly. Which is what exactly. you're essentially saying that they are. Yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, yes, the entire housing benefit bill um, that goes to the private sector is, is you're right, a form of benefits grounding. It's extraordinary. <laughs> um, we touched on Margaret Thatcher earlier. Can you tell me how important right to buy was uh, in creating some of the issues that we have now? Yeah, I think it's really sad. I think if I, if I happen to be running a nice local authority um, and I wanted to build council housing, I probably wouldn't bother because we saw uh, this week the news that this beautiful award-winning scheme in Norwich, um, an awful lot of it has been sold off under the right to buy within three years of its life. And what is the earthly point of, of investing massive amount of public resources in um, a, a social generational good um, if it's going to disappear and be repurposed um, as, as a sort of private gain um, within years of, its, uh, years of its existence? And you have this idea that the state's already paid for all of this stuff once. It's built it. It's built it as a as a social good. And it's now paying for it again in the form of uh, repurposed right to buy flats, being re-let as private, often temporary accommodation mm. at extortionate rates. So I mean, what do you do about that? Do you do you get rid of right to buy? Would I, you have never done the scheme in the first place? I don't think abolishing right to buy should be remotely controversial. Mm. I don't think it's controversial in Scotland where it's already happened. It's, it's, it's a real like fringe demand to keep right to buy in place, or at least it should be. You know, you, you should be embarrassed to stand up and say, I think public assets should be sold off in perpetuity and let the state pay for them over and over again in the form of rents. You see, you don't hear it from that side of it too often because it's normally a very emotive argument you know that uh, you know a man has a right to uh, to own his own home yeah and it's 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 always sold as a sort of like a, you know it's actually sort of as, as a bit of a fairy tale actually yeah, yeah. And it, what should we change sort of like our whole relationship with how we view houses and how we view ownership well i think the idea of 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 selling off right to buy for emotional reasons is a nice idea if you can afford it mm. But, I mean, both parties keep telling us that there isn't a magic money tree. They can't afford um, to keep right to buy in place. Mm. Can we uh, talk a little bit about the legislation mm. in Europe? I love talking about so legislation. <laughs> well, do you know, actually, they like hearing about legislation. <laughs> um, talk to me about the sort of things, uh, sort of regulations in Europe or legislation that you would be in favour of implementing here. Yeah, again, it's worth pointing out just how weird Britain is. I mean, you go to almost <laughs> any city in Europe... They have more or less some form of rent control. Some are weaker, some are stronger. The, the, the rent controls that exist in Ireland aren't particularly strong. The rent controls that exist in Germany are much stronger. But we're in this very, very weird place where we don't have any limit 
on how much landlords can try to extract from tenants. So I'm not, for the time being, I'm not hugely fussed about what we steal, what we borrow and what we implement here. As long as we do something, we can improve it in the future. But take any system you want and bring it here or restore the one that we had here that worked so well for the best part of the 20th century. What would be your... If you had one pick, mm. one bit of legislation that you could implement tomorrow that you've imported in from Europe, what would it be? Um, well, it has to be some form of rent control. Um, it, right. it is a broad social good. Um, it, 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 it makes people's lives less miserable. It makes people's lives more affordable. The only people it doesn't benefit is landlords. And I think we can all agree that's, that we're comfortable with that. Would you get rid of landlording if you could? You know, it's it's not a case of abolishing it. You can't pass the Landlord Abolition Act 2024. But what you can do... I don't do, think you're thinking big enough. <laughs> it, well, <laughs> uh, the point is that the, the state works in more in more discreet ways, but it can abolish landlords and it does abolish landlords. And that, that was the really interesting point about the 70s was that the, the landlords weren't just declining and they weren't just dwindling, but the scale at which they were dwindling was accelerating. Um, and that was to do with state policy. That was to do with high interest rates and rent controls, which meant that it was just simply a bad idea to be a landlord. You couldn't make any money doing it. Um, so you de-incentivize it as an, economic as an economic activity. Smith would disagree that it is an economic activity, but however you do it, the state, through its policies, can generate a system in which landlordism fails. And I think that would be a good thing. I know you touched upon it earlier, but mm. do you think there is a way to be an ethical landlord? Um, no. I think... <laughs> it under current circumstances it's not possible um you even if you're letting below the market rent you're still charging some of the highest rental prices in europe um you could comp i mean you could effectively treat yourself as a local authority and grant a legally secure tenancy but i mean the point i mentioned a moment ago that that even the landlord who comes around to fix the mould, the tenant doesn't necessarily know. The tenant would have to take them at their word. And when the landlord has the absolute right to evict you for any reason or none, they can paint themselves as generously as they'd like. But ultimately, the, they have immense power over the tenant and they could choose to wield it or not. And that's not a healthy situation to be in. How do we get back to the, the 70s style of landlording that you're in favour of without increasing supply? Well, I think that the 70s style, of land, 70s style of landlording was very bad. I mean, they were awful landlords, but the point was that there were much fewer of yeah. them. Um, far, far fewer people were were, um, were being subject to the harm of the private rented sector. It's, it's not difficult to replicate the system of laws that was in place in the 1970s. Um, and of course, when you depress land values, you make it much, much easier for local authorities to build social housing. The biggest barrier they face at the moment, as well as the looming right to buy threat, is how do we get hold of land and how do we build on it? Because at the moment, they're competing with um, Barrett homes. They're competing with uh, um, the people who are destroying Elephant and Castle lend lease. Um, and local authorities just don't have that the, 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 the purchasing power. Whereas if you make that kind of speculative um, price increasing uh, redevelopment unprofitable, suddenly the local authority is the biggest player in town. Could, I mean, a lot of those big um, housing companies that you just spoke about there, a lot of the time, if you, if you speak to any anyone who works high up there, they actually say their work is very unprofitable. They yeah. say that their margins are very slim. And I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that's true. Um, and, and it shows just how easy it would be to drive them out of business if we wanted to. Mm. Looking um, ahead, I mean, there's, there are, there's been a, a sharp increase in the number of millennials who are renting. Um, but millennials are also expected to be, well, but, well, they will be part of the asset class quite soon, actually. Mm. Can you imagine that those millennials, do you, do you think that they would have been turned off of landlording from their own experience? Or do you think that, I don't know, maybe the human condition doesn't... Uh, doesn't <laughs> I, I think, I think I, I take your point. I think that depends an awful lot on, on, the, um, on the, mu the mood music that we create as a society. I think the way... Part of the way in which landlordism was made acceptable was by these TV programs that were just endlessly on in the 2000s about, about playing the property game and how gentle they made it look, how acceptable they made it look. And if we rediscover a sense of revulsion, if we replace those with TV programs about um, just how horrible it feels when you don't know if the landlord is going to kick you out or fix the mould for your own benefit, I would hope that people take that sense of shame on board 
uh, and choose not to. But, you know, fundamentally, I, I wouldn't like there to, to be a situation in which it's, it's the choice of that generation. I would prefer to create the conditions in which it isn't profitable for them to be landlords, in which it makes no sense for them to be landlords, and, and that they should sell up either to someone who's going to live in the house themselves or to, or to someone who's going to do something more socially productive with it, like repurpose it as social housing. It's become quite popular again. It's not just those early... Uh 2000s programs but yeah. it's also you know it's popular again on social media yeah i think it never really went away and some of them they're just really bleak to watch you know you i think the original dream of these programs was that you looked around your dream home and everyone felt good about it but now the host says oh what are you going to do with it and they say i'll just put a coat of paint on it and let it out and you know the fact that you can go on tv and say that without you know without feeling an enormous sense of shame is a very unhealthy sign yeah i mean even on i mean i, I think i was watching uh, something on tiktok just the other day it was um a girl who must have been about 28 she was explaining how you could make a home into an hmo yeah yeah it's it's revolting mm. and um it, when when we had what was called the rackman scandal in this country this this um this scandal of violent thuggery um, in the private rented sector, there was a kind of moment of national shame around the idea of landlordism. And one of the biggest annals at the time was was the church, which sold off an awful lot of its stock because mm -hmm. it, it didn't like the aesthetic of being a landlord. So again, these, these are all things that we have done in the past. It's well within our grasp to do it again. People should be ashamed to make TikToks to say, this is how you make an HMO. Through shame? The church sold it off through shame? Well, it, it was embarrassing. Um, it, was, it was also unprofitable, but, but for a variety of factors, the church... Yeah, massively decreased its its private private landlord practice. How realistic is that ambition going to be in well either of our well near lifetimes? I think I think it really is up to us. I think you're right to point out that the millennial experience is very different, and the generation below us is very different. And I think there is a a, a, cul a, a the culmination of a sense of of unfairness and rage mm. because what the economic purpose that our generation has served is to take all of our income and pass it on to already wealthy older people. And uh, <laughs> at a certain point, that the anger at that situation begins to dominate. At a certain point, the foolishness of that situation begins to dominate. And I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that, um, you know, as people who are in their 30s become, you know, the ones who are running the Labour Party and, and important in government, the common sense there's a sudden outbreak of common sense and everyone says this is a stupid system it's plagued me my entire life i will not have it plagued the next generation so you're hopeful for a yeah a and i think the renters unions are being so good at the moment i think housing campaigns are being so good at the moment and and capturing um that 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 nascent um resistance that that sense of this is wrong um and and purposing it towards landlords so i think the energy's there and, and, and the, the will is there. All we need to do is sort of consolidate it, make sure it's pointed at the right people. And yeah, I, I would be very surprised if we if we come back here in five years' time and we say, well, we've just kept the system of landlordism going. We've done nothing to address it. I mean, even the Conservative Party is passing a renters' reform bill. Well, there's even quite a, a strong Conservative group as well. I think it's priced out, it's called, isn't it? That's yeah. Uh, they're not they're not fans of me, and I'm not a fan of them. Oh no! Why? No, I mean, is it the Marxism? It's the Marxism. It's it's <laughs> it's the. I mean, what what they do is they kind of confect this debate about yimbies and nimbies. They say it's all to do with supply, and if you are not a property development type, then you want to make the housing crisis worse. And it's very effective as discourse. It's very effective at backing people into a corner and saying, "Well, I'm I'm a good guy, so I must be a yimby." Um, and I just think this is a false argument to have. Um, they've won over a lot of politicians, they've won over a lot of influential people. But I think what I would encourage your viewers to do is to question their logic, question their rhetoric, question their data, and say, can you really convince me that there's a supply problem? Or do we solve the housing crisis by the methods that were successful in the 20th century, through regulation, through rent controls, um, through uh, making landlordism a less profitable activity? Mm. But I mean, is there any hope of uh, anyone in the Conservative Party introducing more legislation, more regulation? You know, it, it's it's historically true that Conservatives hasn't li haven't liked landlords, as you've pointed out. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that Tories will say that's enough state spending on landlords now. Um, let's let's that's try and unwind argument. it. That's the sell. I can see that. Yeah, working. I think that and and wage bills, um, but of course. 
landlordism is so wrapped up with home ownership that at the moment the bigger concern in their mind is keeping home ownership going um, and they seem to be willing to spend enormous amounts of public money in the form of housing benefits to make sure that the home ownership system remains in place. Mm. Thank you very much for coming in. It's been a real pleasure.